We're going to be in the fourth chapter of Luke, if you want to turn your Bibles. And, uh, this morning we're going to be looking at the temptation of Jesus, um, how Satan uh, met him in the wilderness to try to uh, tempt him as uh, the Son of Man. Uh, there was a huge nut tree in the cemetery. Uh, and it was surrounded by a fence. And one day there were these two boys. They had gone into the cemetery with a bucket, and uh, they were picking the nuts that had fallen from the, the tree. Uh, but it was kind of on the side of a hill, and, and uh, some of them had, uh, as they were putting them in, in the bucket, some of them had rolled down to the side of the hill down toward the fence. And, and they were dividing them, and one boy was going, one for you, one for me, and one for you, and one for me. And uh, cycling down the road at that same time was a third boy, and he heard the voices coming from inside the cemetery. So uh, he went over to the fence and listened, and he, he heard, one for you, and one for me, and one for you, and one for me. And he says, oh my, that's St. Peter and the devil dividing up the souls. And so he jumped on his bike, and he started riding away real quick, and he, he found this old man hobbling along on a cane. And he said, come quick. You're not going to believe what I heard. Satan and St. Peter are dividing up the souls down at the cemetery. And the old man said, go away, you young whippersnapper. Can't you see I'm having a hard enough time walking as it is? Uh, but the boy was extremely persistent, and he, he kept pulling on the man's uh, sleeve and said, you've got to come and see this. You've got to come quick. And so finally the old man went and uh, with the boy, and sure enough, he heard on the other side of the fence, one for you, one for me, one for you, and one. And, and so he says, boy, you've been telling the truth. Let's go and see if we can see the devil himself. And while they were shivering with fear, as they got right up to the edge, they still weren't able to see uh, over the fence when uh, they heard one of the boys say, one for you. And one for me, one for you, and the last one is for me. Now let's go down to the fence and get those nuts, we, uh, and then we can go home. The nuts that rolled down to the, yes, you got that, okay. I delivered that better in other times. Uh, I've done a lot better job on that earlier. Anyway, uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Uh, the phrase being filled, or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, led, uh, according to Kenneth Wiest, he says in his translation, it's in the imperfect tense, and he uh, uh, translates it this way, being in control of the, whole, of, of the Holy Spirit, uh, or in the control of the Holy Spirit, um, the New American says being led about by the Holy Spirit. In, in, in Mark's translation of it, in his gospel, his, the parallel passage of this in Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 12 says, and immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Uh, that's the word that Mark uses. In fact, it's the word, the word drove there. In the Greek is the word ekbalo, which is the same word that is used of Jesus when he would cast out demons. Uh, he would ekbalo the demons out of people. And it's the same word that uh, Mark uses to describe uh, what the Holy Spirit was doing with the Lord as he drove him into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness that they're talking about here is the Judean wilderness. And it's not, don't you know, your Bible might say desert. And when you think of the, the desert, don't think of like the Saharan or the Sonoran or, or uh, you know, some sort of a uh, just vast sandy wasteland. But in the Bible, when the Bible talks about wilderness, it just means a whole gob of nothing. And here's a picture that I took of the Judean wilderness several years ago. And it just, it's a bunch of rocks on top of a bunch of rocks. And then after that, there's some more rocks. And there, it's a very arid, very dry, very desolate uh, place. And in the summertime, uh, it gets really hot there. It's right down there by the Dead Sea. And it can get up to 120 to 125 degrees in the sun. And that's all the option you got because there's no shade. Uh, and it's a pretty desolate place. And Jesus said, we don't know what time of year it was, but Jesus had been there. It says, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. 
Now, when it says that he was being tempted for 40 days by the devil, one of the, we we got to kind of be careful to, to not, when we think of the devil and how he a, appeared on the scene to tempt Jesus, don't think of like a snap, snidely whiplash from uh, Dudley Do-Right or, or Simon Legree of Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's not that sort of a thing. Or don't think of Johnny a Johnny Blaze type of ghost rider or, or some horned critter with a pitchfork and red PJs. Um, he had to be a lot more subtle than that. I mean, if any one of these guys would have shown up in the desert, Jesus would have just, you know, laughed at him. Um, he's more subtle. He's much more believable than that. He, you know, he, he he doesn't come up to us and say, "Good afternoon, my name is Beelzebub, and I'll be your tempter for this afternoon." You know, he 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 doesn't deal with us in that kind of a way. Uh, he probably showed up. Uh, I mean, he comes wearing a blue tailored suit. You know, or or you know, Vans and Levi's and Under Armour T-shirt and you know, North Face jacket. I mean, he he wasn't super cool. He wasn't uh, like over trendy. He was just believable. And it says that he spent that forty year, days tempting Jesus, and afterwards he became hungry. For 40 days and for 40 nights, he didn't eat or drink. Um, I've heard it said that after four or five days, your hunger ceases. You know, whenever you go on an extended fast, after four, on the fourth or fifth day, your hunger ceases. I wouldn't know that myself. I've never, I, I've read about that, though. I've, I've read from some pretty trusted uh, accounts. Uh, but then um, by the time, the reason why your hunger ceases is because at that time, it's when your stomach begins kind of eating itself. You know, it starts, it, if there's any fat, it starts uh, consuming that first, and then it starts just kind of consuming whatever's left over. And, and when all of that's done, you get hungry. And, and Jesus was hungry. After 40 days, uh, the starvation process had begun. And the devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now, the phrase, if you're the son of God, a lot of the Bible guys like to comment on this is what they got. Wiest and, and uh, Robertson and some of those guys like to point out that this is the condition of the first class, uh, which means that the outcome, it's a, you know, if is an out outcome of possibility, but it says the possibility is already foregone. You, you, you assume it to be true. Uh, and so a good way to translate it, they say, would be since you are the son of God. Uh, since that's who you are, then command the stone to become bread. The New Testament tells us that Satan is the god of this world, doesn't it? It's small g. I mean, it's not not in the sense that there's some sort of pantheon of deity, but it's a he he is called the god of this world in in First Corinthians or Second Corinthians chapter four, starting with verse three. Paul tells us, but even if our gospel is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, meaning Satan, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You know, Satan is the God of this world. He is, the, the, he, sometimes you'll hear him characterized as being, you know, he's always kind of pictured as he's down in the, the dark, cavernous recesses of hell, and there's flames lit. Leap, leaping up out of the, 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 the floor and he's standing there with a pitchfork and his people go down to hell, he pokes them in the rear and, and says, get on down in there. you know. And that, that's not the case. I mean, Satan, is, he is not in hell. He, he is the prince of the power of the air. He is the God of this world. He is here in this world right now. And, and that's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And he, he is tempting Jesus. This is a very real temptation where he comes to Jesus and he says, you're hungry, you haven't eaten in 40 days. Here's a rock. And there's a bunch of them there. I mean, they didn't have to look very far. Here's a rock, just turn it into a loaf of bread. Why would that have been a problem? I mean, he was starving. He was in a place that needed a whole lot less rocks than what they had. Um... They needed a lot more loaves of bread than they needed rocks, and, and he had the tech. <laughs> you know, he, he, he could have done it. Um, 
little wiggle of the nose, little snapping of the fingers, and he could have very easily, I mean, not just simply a loaf of Wonder Bread. He could have had a Big Mac. You know, he could have had all, all, this, all, all the fixings to go with it. Um, a fresh baked croissant just flattered with butter. You know, he could have done that. What would have been wrong with that? Why would that have been such a problem? John writes in his first epistle in 1 John chapter 2, uh, very well-known passage, verse 16 of 1 John chapter 2, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. John is saying that our entire sphere of temptation, if you will, Every area, every avenue, every type of temptation we will ever undergo is going to fall under one of those three uh, areas. It's going to either be the lust of the, the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life. And within each arena, the temptation, uh, it might appear in a variety of different ways. You know, I mean, uh, not all lusts of the eyes look the same. Not all lusts of the flesh are going to be... Uh, born out in the same what what might be my lust of the flesh might not be your lust of the flesh but it's all going to be one of those three john says all that is in the world are these three things uh, i mean it might be going into debt for a new vehicle that you can't afford because you want to keep up appearances you know it could be that or it could be lying about why you're late for work because you just wanted to push the snooze a few more times and so you say a lie you know about well i had a flat tire or I had static cling and I couldn't get rid of the static cling on my socks or something like that, you know. Uh, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And he says to Jesus, he says, turn one of these stones into bread. Um, and notice what Jesus' response is. He says, uh, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Quoting from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. And this would fall under the first one of John's uh, categories, the lust of the flesh. It's the same thing. I mean, like, as I said, all temptations fall under one of these three. And it's the very same thing. In fact, Satan, he's only got three things. He's got three cards in his deck, and he always deals the same ones. Uh, and they work. It's not that he uh, lacks originality, which he does, but he doesn't need to do any more because they work. It's the very same thing he did in the Garden of Eden that, that he's doing with Jesus that he does with us. And in Genesis chapter 3, when he was tempting Eve, it says in verse 6, And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh. Now, for those of you that have been at Calvary Chapel for, of Oklahoma City for very long, you know that the fruit wasn't an apple. It wasn't an apple tree. It was a Brussels sprouts tree. Um, and that was the that was the original sin was when they were eating uh, the Brussels sprouts, but they tasted just like tacos al carbon. You know, I mean, it was uh, they they tasted really good back then. Uh, and uh, when she saw, you know, I mean, you know, how do you turn down a big tree full of tacos al carbon? You know, um, in in John chapter six. Uh, when after Jesus had fed the multitudes, and then it says he, he got on a on a boat and he went over to the other side, and uh, the next morning uh, the people woke up and it was time for breakfast. You know they they slept all night because they they had been glutted, is what the uh, the text says the night before by the multiplying of the loaves and fishes. And so the next morning it was time for breakfast and they went looking for Jesus, you know. Get him to do this trick again. And they saw where he had gone over on the other side, and so they ran around the lake to get over uh, to the other side where he was at. And they come walking up to him, and they said, Jesus, show us a sign that we might believe in you. Well, he had just multiplied these loaves and fishes and fed 5,000 men plus women and children just hours before, and yet they wanted him to show them a sign so that they could know whether they should place their faith in him or not. Which in the original language, if you were to translate it, uh, it means, could you feed us some breakfast? We're hungry, feed us again. And Jesus says, you, you're here because I fed you the loaves and fishes. But, uh, you know, I'm talking about a bread uh, that when you eat, you don't ever get hungry again. And so they, they thought they would kind of like pull one over on him and say, well, you know, 
Moses gave us manna in the wilderness. What are you going to do? And, and so Jesus told him, he said, yeah, Moses gave you manna in the wilderness, and, and uh, the next day they were hungry again. But I've got some food that you eat, you'll never be hungry again. And over a period of time, they began to understand that what he was talking about was not physical food. He was talking about spiritual food. And they weren't interested in that. They wanted physical food. It was breakfast, and their stomachs were growling. And they, would, they weren't interested in what he had to say spiritually. They only wanted to see what he would do for them at that moment. And it says in verse 60 that when they had, uh, of John chapter 6, uh, that when they had heard that, they said, this is a hard saying. This is, this is kind of tough, telling us you're more concerned with our spiritual lives than you are our physical lives. And by the time we get to verse 66, it says, and from that day, many of his disciples turned away and followed him no more. You know, what this is talking about with Jesus being tempted to turn the stone into bread, why this would have been problematic. I can remember as a child uh, uh, being taught this story and, and just kind of thinking, he was hungry though. Why would that have been a problem? Why is it wrong to eat when you're hungry? Uh, but what he would have been doing is using God's giftings. He'd been using God's abilities, that which God had given to him to use for God's glory. He would be using that for himself. And that would have been wrong. As small of the matter as it would have been, it would have been infinitely more uh, terrible than it was for Adam and Eve to eat the Brussels sprouts. Whenever we use God's abilities, we use God's gifts for our own benefit. Uh, that's the lust of the flesh. And, you know, this wasn't a challenge by the devil uh, to be strong. You know, since you're the son of God, wiggle your nose, snap your fingers, stomp your feet. Uh, just command this stone to become a loaf of bread, and then you can prove that you're the son of God. This wasn't a, a challenge by the devil for Jesus to man up. You know, you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, take care of yourself here. It wasn't That wasn't what his, he was challenging him to do. It wasn't challenging him to, to be strong. He was challenging him to be independent, which is a whole other thing. You know, what he was saying is you don't need the Father. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's drove, driven you in here, out here to the wilderness. Uh, you don't need to be filled by him. You can do this yourself. You're the Son of God. You don't need to be dependent upon God. You don't need to be filled by his Spirit. And Jesus said, man shouldn't live, is not going to live by bread alone. But instead, he's going to live by the word of God. And so verse 5 says, Then the devil, taking him up onto a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All authority, or all this authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. And I will give it to whomever I, and I, give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Now, notice that Jesus, he, he makes a very bodacious statement here. You know, he says, uh, all of this, all the kingdoms of the world are mine. And if you worship me, I'll give it to you because I can give it to whomever I want. Jesus doesn't challenge that statement. He doesn't say, no, uh, -uh not yours. You know, it had originally been given to Adam in the garden. He had been given... Uh, dominion over the earth. All the things on the earth and the fullness thereof belonged to Adam. It was given to him by God. God said, here, take care of it. But Adam forfeited it uh, when they ate the fruit. And that's when Satan became the God of this world. And, and Jesus doesn't challenge his statement in that. But he does say, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God. This is verse 8. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Again, quoting from Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 13. That brings us to the second one, the lust of the flesh. Or, I'm sorry, the lust of the eyes. And in Genesis chapter 6, when Eve saw that it was good for food, and the last, next part of verse 6 of Genesis 3, it was pleasant to the eyes. Lust of the eyes. You know, Satan has a single-minded goal in all of his various temptations, all the different ways that he comes and tries to deceive us and to delude us. He has, there's, he has one goal. There's one thing that he's trying to accomplish. 
And that is to get us to worship anything, anybody, any being other than God. He doesn't care if we turn into Satan worshipers. In fact, I think he would much rather have us sitting in a church service, worshiping the church service, worshiping the aesthetics of the church service, worshiping the worship of the church service. He would much rather have us doing that than he would have us uh, drinking blood and worshiping an upside-down uh, pentagram. Uh, because that's kind of that only takes you so far, you know. I mean that 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 sort of thing doesn't really satisfy. And I, I it, it, that that's just that, that's a facade. That's just uh, that's just a ruse. That that has impact on such a small minority of the people that it doesn't really even ha uh, warrant being referenced. But the delusion of religion, that's pretty powerful. And, and so he says, you shall worship. The Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. Satan wants us to worship anything or anybody but God. Hollywood has tapped into this storyline. You know, I mean, how many movies have there been about some musician who sells his soul to the devil so that he can be this world-class guitar player, you know, or, or uh, the Wall Street broker who sells his soul to the devil so that he can become a very rich Wall Street tycoon. You know, that's, that, that's kind of a worn-out storyline. But Walt... Hollywood and the media entertainment industry has has tapped into that. Um, or it can just be the desire to want to be noticed. Uh, you know, that would that would be, you know, we, we we nip and tuck and we pump and stretch and and we do all this just so that someone will covet what we have. Same thing. You know, we worship ourselves. And it's the desire for the, the rush in all of its different forms. You know, I, I can re remember when I first came to the Lord, and I, I just, I was, I, I, I worshiped the buzz of life. Jesus says, God only shall you worship and serve. You know, and we, we, we become slaves to creature comforts, we, we worship our creature comforts. And and we become very religious about that, and uh, we can go to great extents and great lengths to try to preserve our creature comforts. Well, verse nine, it says he, and this is meaning Satan. He brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, "If you are the Son of God, again, condition of the first class. Since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written." He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up. And this is quoting from Psalm 91. Um, the devil says to Jesus, Oh, you want to quote scripture? I know scripture too. Uh, you know, I, I, I would think it would be a safe bet to say that the devil knows scripture better than any of us here. Uh, you know, he's been reading it for a long time. He's been around a long time, and he's been using it. He's been twisting it. He's been trying to uh, cherry-pick it, trying to give us the edited version of it, trying to lift it out of its context and, and make it say something that it doesn't say. And he's become very adept at that. Uh, he's very good at that. And he says, he shall give his angels charge over you. This is, you know, even though he's taking Psalm 91 out of context, he says that's just the word of God. You can't deny what the Bible says because he's going to keep you. And in their hands they uh, shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. So the devil says, okay, you want to use scripture? I can use scripture. So Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And so, again, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16 this time. Which brings us to the third one. He says there's the lust of the eyes, the lust, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Uh, again, Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 6 says, And when she saw that it was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and then lastly, that it was a tree desirable to make one wise. That's all it took. And, and it was at that point that she chomped down. Uh, many of us have probably heard of uh, Adoniram Judson. He was one of the uh, 
he was uh, from uh, the colonies and sometimes accredited to be the first uh, missionary to Burma, but he wasn't quite, but he was the first one to go there and stay. And he began translating the English Bible into uh, uh, the native tongues of the uh, indigenous people there in, in Burma and uh, even in parts of India. And his son, who was born in Burma, but then later became a pastor in Boston for many, many years, uh, Edward Jensen, and he said, if we succeed without suffering, it's because others have suffered before us. But if we suffer without succeeding, it's that others may succeed after us. Think about that for a second. If we succeed without suffering, it's because others have suffered before us. But if we uh, suffer without succeeding, then it's because others will come after us and succeed on, on our behalf because of the, of the path that we have blazed. All three of Jesus' references, when he quotes the Bible to Satan, when he says, for it is written, all three of them come from Deuteronomy. Uh, chapter 8, verse 3, chapter 6, verse 13, and chapter 6, verse 16. Deuteronomy was the, the book that, it, it's, it means second law. The word Deuteronomy means second law. And it pretty much is just a recapitulation of everything that Moses had written earlier. But this was written, you know, when he first got the Ten Commandments and he got all the, the elements of Levitical law and all of that sort of thing when they were at Mount Sinai. Uh, a generation has come and gone. Forty years of them wandering around in the wilderness. And the generation that left Egypt has died in the desert, and their sons and daughters are the ones that are inheriting the promise. They're the ones that are about to cross over the Jordan and enter into the land of Canaan. And so Moses writes the book of Deuteronomy shortly before they cross over, kind of rewriting the law, uh, rewriting his books, uh, rephrasing a lot of what had been said earlier, so it would be fresh and new for this new generation that's just about to go in and inherit the land. And he says in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 17, verses 18 to 20, and also this, he, he's rebuking the Israelites uh, for their wilderness failures. And he says in Deuteronomy 17, starting with verse 18, also it shall be when he, meaning the king, when they enter into the land and they have a king, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from one before the priest, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, and that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, and he and his children in the midst of Israel. So in other words, Moses wrote in Deuteronomy, chapter 17, that when you have a king that ascends to the throne, the very first order of business is for him to write out the entire book of Deuteronomy in his own handwriting. He should write it all out to himself so that he won't have any excuse. He can't say, I didn't know that, because he was going to write it out in his own, own uh, handwriting uh, to demonstrate that he had read the book of Deuteronomy, but then he says, and also he will keep it with him, he'll carry it with him, and he will honor it and obey it all the days of his lives. I, I wonder if there's a connection between what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and the fact that Jesus quoted Deuteronomy when he was doing battle with the devil. I mean, could it, could it possibly be this is why King Jesus used Deuteronomy uh, to defeat Satan? Something, and I, I just I kind of say this as an aside, but I think it's worthy of note uh, because there's a lot of I, people get kind of confused by this. But notice that he didn't say, "I rebuke you, Satan." You know, when he said, "Get behind me, Satan," he, he didn't say, "I rebuke you, Satan," um, which is kind of odd, you know, because we have so much of that going on today, and it's kind of interesting. I think it's worthy of note that Jesus didn't say that. In fact, in, in Zechariah, in his prophecy, in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2, it says, And the Lord said, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Uh, you know, the Lord said, The Lord rebuke you. Uh, same thing that Michael, uh, Michael the archangel said. In, in Jude, it says that Michael the archangel didn't say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You know, he didn't say that. He says, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Michael said that. The Lord said that. 
I don't know why so many people want to do that in our day and age. They want to say, I rebuke you, Satan. In fact, one of the things that kind of bothers me most about that, it's not so much that I think it's wrong to say that, but the majority of the times I hear it said is in the middle of a prayer. You know, somebody's praying, and they're praying to God, and they're saying, God, we love you, and we, we thank you for all your blessings, and we want to serve you, and we, uh, you are just so worthy of everything, and Satan, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and we command you to get out of here, and blah, blah. And we started off talking to the Lord before, before we're done with the prayer. We're talking to Satan. And where in the Bible does it tell us to do that? You know, I don't, I, I'm not saying that it's wrong to say, I rebuke you, Satan, but I just think it's better to do what Michael did. I think it's better to do what the Lord did and just say, the Lord rebuke you. And then it says in verse 13, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Um, your, your Bible may say something about until, a more, uh, until another opportunity. Um, that's kind of the idea. There will be, and, and you know, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. I mean, we started off last week with his baptism. Now he's been driven by the Spirit. The Spirit fills him, and then he drives him into the wilderness so that he can be tempted. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And in the next three and a half years, the devil is going to find many opportune times to tempt him. This wasn't the ending of it. This was just the beginning of it. Uh, there's going to be several opportune times between now and the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus had told the disciples, right after Peter had made his great profession of faith, you know, who do the people say I am? And Peter says, well, you're the Son of God. And, and Jesus says, yeah, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but the Father who's in heaven is the one that told you that. And, and, and Peter looked around at the other 11 to make sure they heard that, you know. You check that out. You hear what he said about me? You know, God speaks to me. And, and then and right after that statement, right after uh, Jesus has said, uh, and, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church, and boy, that, that really puffed him up. And then right after that, it says that Jesus began telling them. He began telling them. It wasn't just simply a statement. It was something that he began telling them uh, that he was going to Jerusalem and he was going to be uh, delivered over to the authorities. They were going to do whatever they wanted to with him. Uh, he was going to be beaten at their hands, and then he was going to be crucified, and then he would rise again on the third day. And as soon as he got to that part about being crucified, Peter checked out. He didn't hear that part about rise on the third day. He said, Lord, that far be it from you, Lord. That shall never happen to you. And Jesus looks at him, and he says, it's Matthew 16, verse 23, and he looks at Peter, and he says, get behind me, Satan. Same thing he said here. I, I can picture because uh, there was a movie done back in the 60s known as The Greatest Story Ever Told. And uh, Donald Pleasance played the part of, uh, he, he was, if you look him up in the credits, he's the hermit slash Satan. You know, he just, he's kind of like this hermit guy uh, that uh, he, he's, he's the one that tempts Jesus when he's in the wilderness. And, and in fact, every, every time where the Lord is uh, like when the time when they were going to take him and throw him off the cliff after he had said uh, in Nazareth that uh, uh, today this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing and, and they got all upset and they were going to throw him off the side of a cliff uh, and you see the people getting mad at him. Uh, every time you would see one of those scenes or when uh, he was rebuking the Jewish leadership or, or whatever, anytime there was a crowd that time afterwards, you would see Donald Pleasance there in the middle of the crowd. And he's just there, you know, he's just, he's just kind of there, just part of the crowd, uh, making an opportunity of the time that had been given. And, and that would, went on continually throughout Jesus' three-and-a-half-year uh, uh, ministry, uh, whether it was his encounters with the religious people or the people themselves getting upset or, or uh, whatever. Hebrews chapter 4. Author to Hebrews says in verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
See, that, that, that's one of the things about the Lord that it just sets him apart. This is, this is unique. There, there, there is, it's unparalleled in all spiritual realms. There, there is no other faith system. There is no other religion, uh, no other spirituality known to man uh, that parallels what happens here with Jesus. Uh, you know, the, the Hindus have many incarnations of God. That's, that's nothing new. The Egyptians had, they believed that Pharaoh was an incarnation of, of Osiris. That's, that's nothing new. The fact that God would become man is not anything new. But the fact that God would become a man and be tempted at all points as we are and yet not sin and then take the place of mankind in judgment, that's unique. That, that's no, no other system of religion has, no, that could not originate from the mind of man. And he says that we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus is our high priest. He, is, he has been tempted in every way in which we have. He, he, he's been hit by the big three, not just simply during that time when he was in the desert. But he's been tempted by uh, the lust of uh, the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life many times over during his time in the flesh. And yet he never succumbed. By the way, temptation is not a sin. You, you, you do understand that, don't you? We, you, you do know that. Uh, I, I think we all do, but it is, I still think even though we know that temptation is not a sin, it's still there's such a fine line between being tempted and then thinking that we've actually sinned because of the temptation. And so, well, I've already sinned. I might as well just go ahead and do it. Because Jesus said if you've committed uh, adultery in your heart, you've committed If you look at a, a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. And I look with lust, I might as well just go ahead and commit adultery. You know, there's such a fine line uh, between the temptation and biting down on it that it's still a pretty effective tool of the enemy, even though we know that temptation is not a sin. Yet Jesus was tempted in all points as we are. You know, one of the things when uh, guys go to seminary, one of the things that they'll sit around in the dorm rooms at night and debate, debate over and over and over again ad nauseum is the question, could Jesus have sinned if he wanted to? And some of you say, well, no, he couldn't have sinned if he wanted to because he was God. God can't sin. That would be, that would be contrary to his nature. And then some of you say, but how could he be tempted like we are without the capacity. But I understand he didn't have the propensity. He didn't have the sin nature. There wasn't an urge. But how could he have been tempted as we are without at least the capacity to do so? And so the debate goes on and on. Uh, I don't know what's true about it. I just know Jesus was in all points tempted as I am. And yet he never succumbed. He never, he never bit. He never sinned. I, have you ever been you know, during like maybe when we're having our time at the Lord's table, or or something like that, uh, when you're having a time of introspection, and and uh, maybe you're having a, a a quiet time or something like that, and, and the Lord just sort of ministers something to your heart. You just kind of become aware that there's a lack of growth. You know, it's just kind of like your life is kind of sort of stagnated, and and you're you're just like stuck on high center kind of thing. Have Have you ever had that? sort of awareness, struck by the lack of spiritual growth in your life? I have. Of course, I think we all have at some time or another. And I, I think that could it be, and as, as I have had my times of introspection and I've kind of reevaluated things in my own life, take, taking that spiritual inventory in my life, I've, I've noticed that there can oftentimes be a correlation um, between the lack of spiritual growth in my life and um, lack of commitment in other areas, you know, where maybe I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm saying, well, I'll, I'll do this, but I won't do that. Um, I'll, I'll give you this, God, but I won't give you that. Or I'll, I'll participate in here in, in this, but I won't participate in that. Or whatever it may be that there's some sort of a, a reservation, there's some sort of a, a boundary, a perimeter, uh, self-imposed around our commitment level. To the Lord, and I think that when I, I found in my life that whenever I do that, whenever I, uh, I I realize that I might sing the song that I surrender all, but I really didn't surrender all, and and then He's showing me that I didn't surrender all, and then I'm thinking, but I'm not going to surrender that anyway. Uh, 
there's a there's like a stagnation that takes place in my spiritual growth. And I think one of the the you know uh, I have and I don't think I'm that different. I, I have become a master of as I, I said earlier. You know we 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 cling to our feature comforts, and I'm not talking about uh, remote controls and air conditioning. You know that's sure that's part of it, but I just it's having things the way we want it, when we want it, and, and in the way that we want it. We've become slaves to that. And and I've become not only a slave to it, but I've become a, pretty much a master at preserving it. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can avoid suffering and sacrifice pretty easily uh, at, in the name of suffering and sacrifice. But I think if we look at those who have the fullness of the spirit if if we look at 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 those who have a strong and an excited and a vibrant spiritual life if, if we take a look at the the you know sometimes i i i i think well how you know this person over here seems to just like they they just rock steady with the lord what is their secret how is it that they're able to get that fullness when it seems to sometimes evade me and, and I think that the common denominator that we find with all people that uh, are living that that just that full life in Jesus, that John 10:10 10, 10 kind of experience of uh, having a life in that more abundantly, I think it's though the, there's a common denominator with all of them, and that is uh, that the, the the thing that all excited, full, vibrant believers have in common is suffering. And by that, I don't necessarily mean suffering, imprisonment, or or uh, fear of physical safety, or, or that kind of a thing. That you know, it, uh, I mean, in the West, we know nothing about that. Uh, but I think we can have a vibrant life in the West, nonetheless. You know, I don't, it's not just simply talking about that kind of suffering, uh, but it's the kind of suffering that comes from that's associated with dying to self. It's that kind of suffering. Uh, the, the 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 sort of thing that we put our creature comforts aside, we put our own wa wants and our own prerogatives and our own privileges and our own uh, uh, wanas aside, because it's not about us. That kind of suffering. And I don't think that automatically brings in the abundant life, but I don't think it's a negotiable aspect of it either. First Corinthians. Very well-known passage in First Corinthians chapter ten, uh, verses eleven and, and twelve, and we're probably familiar with it. Uh, but I'd like to share it with you from the New Living Translation. It says First uh, Corinthians ten twelve: If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different than from what others experience, and God is faithful, and He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you're tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. You know the passage? We're all familiar with it, right? Before I explain what Paul is saying here in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's look at what it's not saying. Um, it's not saying that uh, no matter what horribly painful situation we find ourselves in, uh, no matter how overwhelmingly or overpoweringly the heartache that we might experience in life may be, uh, that all we got to do is reach down and grab a hold of some grit and pull ourselves up and put on our big boy pants and and look the devil right in his beady eyes and say, "Is that the best you got, you little maggot-infested piece of dork vomit?" It's not saying that, okay? Uh, it's not saying he's not going to give you more than you can handle. So whatever it is, you just you know duke it out with the devil and, and do what Jesus did. It's not saying that because sometimes I've learned in my life, and I bet you have too, sometimes he gives us more than we can handle so that we will learn lean on him so that we won't try to handle it ourselves. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about temptation. He's talking about with every temptation, there's going to be a way of exit. There's going to be a way that we can uh, get uh, past it. What it is saying is that we can always trust in him. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is saying. It's that we can always rest in Him. We can always find strength in Him. 
uh, we can always find escape in him. What it is saying is that we can always find victory in him. The devil has fired his best volleys, and he's lost. Not because of us, but because of who is in us. Amen? Let's pray. God, we, uh, we thank you for that victory. We thank you for that escape. You've given us the way of escape from all temptation, Lord. The, the devil has fought, and he has lost. And uh, I acknowledge that there's not a, uh, a thing that I can do that could uh, dissuade him in any way. There's nothing in my power that could give uh, Satan even pause. But there's nothing that he can do that gives you pause. Uh, and Lord, that in you we have that victory. We have that fullness. We have that peace. We have that rest. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for setting us free. And thank you for proclaiming that in when we have that freedom, we are free indeed. And that we are no longer, because of this victory, we no longer have to offer our instruments uh, as instruments of unrighteousness, our members as instruments of unrighteousness. But we can offer our members as instruments of righteousness because we can conclude, reckon ourselves, indeed dead to sin. Thank you, Lord, for that victory. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We, give you, we, we rest in your Son, Jesus, as we ask it in his name. Amen.